Hi, I'm Jay Schubert. We're here at the 79th Scientific Sessions of the American Diabetes Association in San Francisco, California. We have many exciting studies to talk about at this uh, conference, but one that we're going to talk about today is the D2D study. I'm happy to have with me Anastasio Spitas, who is the lead uh, investigator from Tufts Medical Center, and I'm happy to have you on, on the show today. Pleasure to be here. Tell me about the D2D study, please. Yeah, so um, observational studies have shown that people with low vitamin D level, they have higher risk of developing diabetes. However, whether vitamin D supplementation lowers risk of diabetes is not known. So we did the D2D study to test the hypothesis that vitamin D supplementation lowers risk of diabetes in people at risk for diabetes. And certainly we see that as a very common uh, finding. So what were the main results? Um, so uh, first of all, we found that the 4,000 units per day that we gave to participants did not have any uh, safety signals. And in the overall cohort, we found a 12% uh, risk reduction in um, diabetes. However, the effect was not statistically significant. Okay. So for that population, they did not reduce the risk of diabetes. Was that true across the entire population or were there some differences within the population? So we looked at um, a small subgroup of the cohort with uh, vitamin D deficiency defined by a level of less than 12 nanograms per ml, which is the definition by the Institute of Medicine. Among these participants, there was a 62% reduction in diabetes risk. However, subgroup analysis should be interpreted uh, conservatively, uh, but this is a large size, uh, effect size and consistent with physiology, so it's probably true. So for those people who were uh, insufficient of vitamin D, they saw a benefit. That's right. So the rest of the population, they had plenty of vitamin D? Yes, so the, uh, about 80% of participants at baseline had a level above 20 nanograms per ml, which would be considered sufficient by most US guidelines. Um, we know from physiology that the response to a nutrient depends on where you start. So if you have sufficient levels to begin with, it may be less likely to see an effect and vice versa. So high dose of vitamin D, if you're already sufficient, probably is not protective. Um, it will be much more difficult to show an effect because you've already near optimal levels. Okay. So I know that in many of the trials, having patients or participants follow the instructions is an important part of that, and we use intention to treat analysis. Was, was there an effect of adherence in this study that made a difference? Overall, adherence in the study was extremely good. We, we, we were very happy. However, among non-adherent participants, there were some differences. So more people in the placebo group took diabetes medications or weight loss medications or high doses of vitamin D outside of the study. On the other hand, more people in the vitamin D group stopped the study pills for any reason. So we think that these differences may have shifted the result towards the null in the intent to treat analysis. So we did a, what we call a per protocol analysis, and when we did this, the risk reduction improved to about 16% overall. So for what I've heard so far is that the overall results of the study is that vitamin D supplementation did not prevent type 2 diabetes in the overall population, but in those that were insufficient, and those who are adherent, there were some benefits. I think that uh, would be a correct statement. So if you're going to move to the next study, what would be the, the next logical step in vitamin D study in type 2 diabetes? Um, I think we have done quite a few studies in this area as well. And there are also large, other large studies that will, will be published soon. And so we can learn from these studies. I wanted to point out two other relatively large studies, smaller than ours, but still large studies, one from Norway, one from Japan, that tested vitamin D supplementation for um, risk reduction in diabetes among those at high risk of diabetes. Their result was also non-statistically significant, but it was nearly identical to ours. Okay. So what our team plans to do is combine data from these three trials and see if we can learn more from what has already been done. 
So hearing you saying that we really have some consistency in the data, going back to general practice, what do I do with vitamin D and people at risk for diabetes? I think we need to follow the general recommendations. So having a level over uh, 20 nanograms per ml is probably sufficient. Um, and vitamin D deficiency defined as a level less than 12 nanograms should be avoided for a number of reasons, including probably diabetes. Uh, thank you, that's important. I think I also heard you say that in your study the safety data was there as well. So I can feel comfortable in general practice taking 4,000 milligrams of vitamin D supplementation, even if you have uh, mildly lower levels, not insufficient levels of vitamin D. Is that true? That's, that's correct. So the safety benefit ratio is probably uh, very um, high. Okay, so for, for to summarize this, the D2D study found that overall vitamin D supplementation in the general population did not reduce your new onset type 2 diabetes. There were subgroups that seemed to have benefit, particularly those who stayed on the treatment, as well as those that were insufficient. And we now know that vitamin D supplementation is clearly safe at a 4,000 milligram per day, per day dose. Yep, that's correct. And we also plan to look at um, the effect of vitamin D in insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity. So we, we will be looking at mechanisms as well to support the data that we already have. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing the results of the D2D trial. Thank you for the opportunity. You bet. And I thank, want to thank all of you for participating in the Medscape's learning series.